Welcome everyone to this first marketing kind exchange of 2023. It's not our first gathering of the new year, of course, um, but it is also uh, the first time we've ever done one of our exchanges um, via Zoom meetings rather than Zoom webinar uh, so that we can all see each other and so that we can all get um, a little bit more up close and personal with our guests. Um, and that also means that um, when we get to audience, uh, when we get to, to group questions at about 5.50 or shortly thereafter, you'll be able to put your, your questions directly, in this case, to John as well. Um, we do have a number of guests with us, so by way of the briefest introduction to Marketing Kind, we're a, a community of marketers and change makers who believe that the world's most pressing problems, whether we're thinking globally or locally, um, depend for their resolution, most importantly, even more than on finance and on technology, on forms of human cooperation. Uh, and so we can choose to read them as marketing briefs in disguise. So we come together every month to upcycle our marketing skills in support of pioneering charities and social enterprises, to coach and support each other in becoming more impactful and conscious leaders in the day jobs through our Your Marketing Kind and digital fireside gatherings. Um, and we also get a chance to work with some of our real heroes uh, in exploring how we can change some of the bigger stories that we live and work by uh, for the better. Uh, through our exchange program, such as today. Um, turning to today's theme, this is uh, our third gathering this month on the theme of uh, regenerative approaches that go beyond sustainability to actively restore our environment and, and play a part in contributing to a fairer and more inclusive society. Uh, obviously, towards the end of 2022, uh, according to Collins Dictionary, the, 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 they chose the word of the year, the uh, perma crisis. And as we start the new year, um, we know, of course, that um, there could be in some ways worse to come as well as, as better to come. But nevertheless, our hopeful and ambitious question for today is how can we regenerate our fragile world? It's a big question. It's a fundamentally hopeful question, and we couldn't be in better company to seek out the answers to it than John Elkington, one of the pioneers of the global sustainability movement. And John, we were just talking with John about the term sustainability. So, John, if you take issue with any the language, the description, the background we're giving in your bio, you can just jump straight in and challenge me on it. So one of the pioneers of the global sustainability movement. John's written over 20, 20 books, including Cannibals with Forks, which popularized the hugely um, impactful triple bottom line concept, also known as people, planet and profit, and laid the foundations for a sustainable business strategy. And his latest book, Green Swans, The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism, was published in April 2020. In 2009, a CSR international survey of the top 100 CSR leaders placed John fourth after Al Gore, Barack Obama and the late Anita Roddick of The Body Shop, and alongside Mohammed Yunus of the Grameen Bank. He co-founded Volance, a think tank and advisory firm operating at the intersection of innovation and sustainability to span the yawning divide between what the sustainability industry is doing and what needs to be done. Wonderful. So, so welcome to Marketing Kind, John. Well, thank you, uh, Paul, and thank you, Louise, and hello, everyone. I, I, I recognize a few faces, uh, including the only true in I know in the uh, known universe, but most of your faces I don't recognize, and um, and that's exciting because, oh, I know John Grant, um, but because the more we can interact with people we don't know, the better. But And, and just a public vote of thanks. I mean, uh, I, Lynn Franks uh, has wandered off into the kitchen, but uh, went way back when we were launching the green consumer movement, which had quite a strong marketing edge uh, to it. Lynn was immensely uh, helpful in, in, in building that building that campaign. So, you know, I did some debts uh, uh, of gratitude are flying every which way uh, here. But back to you, Paul and Louise, and, and uh, I'm in your hands. Well, we'll we'll try and repay our debt of gratitude to you for joining us today by absorbing and acting on as much of your wisdom as possible but oh, uh, 
as uh, as Louise said, you've not only um, been such a driving force in creating and shaping the the sustainability movement, but it may well still be that one of your early ideas um, that I remember reading about when I first met you in Cannibals with Forks, the idea of the triple bottom line that you subsequently um, sort of redubbed people, planet and profit may still be um, your best known idea. Um, and yet on its 25th anniversary, uh, you decided to write a prominent article in the Harvard Business Review to recall that idea. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you could talk us through why you chose to recall it. And also, you know, maybe a reading between the lines, was it because you thought the idea was faulty or was it because in a sense, the users of the idea were faulty? <laughs> well, that would be an arrogant um, assertion, but but it, that was part of it. Um, let me just go back. I mean, you you say that the the people planet profit formulation replaced the triple bottom line. And what happened was in '94, I came up with the, the the basic language around triple bottom line, having been trying to get there for 18 months, and you know it, it, it may seem ridiculous to spend 18 months getting to three words, but that's how long it. Um, took me. And then the following year, just to slightly popularize it, I, I, I picked the um, one of two options that we had then. One was people, planet, uh, and profit. And the other one was profit instead of profit, prosperity. To your question about the recall, I was quite intrigued because a, lo a lot of people who uh, work in business, it turned out, didn't terribly well understand what a product recall is. And I'd worked with companies like Ford, Volvo, Toyota, and I, I, I know what a recall is, where something goes wrong on a Tesla or whatever it happens to be, uh, and, and you pull back, you hope it's only tens of thousands, but in some cases, it's hundreds of thousands or millions uh, of products to correct uh, some intrinsic problem with the design. And then you put these things back uh, into use. And the idea with the recall wasn't that, as some people assumed, I was slamming the whole notion of the triple bottom line on a, on a spike and leaving it there to dangle. Because, I mean, if, if you look back at the wider impact of the idea, um, you've had global reporting initiative, the Dow Jones Sustainability Indexes, you know, 5,000 and counting B corporations, and, and so on and so forth, sort of embracing this notion. In addition to which, you've had an absolute frenzy of, of follow-on mm -hmm. uh, concepts. When I, I mean, the double bottom line came afterwards, ESG and so on, all, all, all came afterwards. And I think part of what I was trying to reflect on and try and help people think through was, aren't we just building a Tower of Babel here, uh, firstly? But then secondly, that to your point about people not, uh, it, it being around the users, the trouble with any concept and regeneration is going to go through exactly that uh, trajectory. As it gets adopted in a wider world, as it mainstreams, it dilutes. You, you get people applying their own vested interests and, and priorities and so on to it. So you have people using language uh, in, a, in a way that is just not appropriate. And, and just to conclude, I mean, one of the things that we saw from the very outset back in the 90s was people using the triple bottom line as a trade-off framework uh, so that you know you typically hear people saying well we made a profit well that didn't exactly address the fuller economic agenda and we provided people jobs and to some degree with what they were prepared to buy if not what they always needed shame about the environment and you that, that's putting a slightly dramatic edge on 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 on, on the dynamics of that but you often s saw that whereas the the whole idea of the triple bottom line was that it should be about integrated solutions. One of our clients at, at a German company, Covestra, uh, some years back, put it, I thought, really, really nicely, which was he said that at its wor at the worst, any business embracing the triple bottom line should de um, deliver positive value on at least two of the dimensions, and at worst, a net. Uh, uh, equal sort of, you know, not going in the wrong direction on the third uh, dimension. Anyway, the, the overall response to the recall was profoundly positive, including from the B Corporation movement, B Lab and so on. Um, and and at, at 
out of the process that followed on from that, I got to the sort of next stage around regeneration, but we can talk about that later on. Thank you, John. So I'd I'd love to move on to talk about Green Swans now, yeah. uh, your, your most recent book. And just in a bit of a classic um, essay writing uh, style, I'd love to just make sure that we're um, clear on the concepts that we're talking about as a, as a group here. I don't want to assume everyone's had the opportunity to read the book. I'd highly recommend it, of course. Um, but could you just talk us through the meaning of green swans, a, a green swan, and also other yeah. kinds of green, other kinds of swan that we can um, understand in comparison? And, and well, I'm happy, no, I'm happy to do that, Louise. A couple of uh, cautionary notes before I start. One is that the basic idea of swans uh, came from uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Some of you will have read his book, uh, The Black Swan, that came out in 2007 just ahead of the 2008-9 crash. Um, the other thing is that once I'd done the book Green Swans, there was another Green Swans initiative that came out through the, in, the Bank of International Settlements. Uh, and they define, and I'll come on to my definition, but they define Green Swans as exponential solutions to climate issues. Now, I've, I took it wider my, my, my sense was that green swans could be anything that uh, for example addressed any of the sustainable development goals and it, uh, ideally a cluster of them in, in in a way that went to scale very rapidly what what uh, Taleb meant as most of you will know is that black swans in his definition uh, could be good they could be bad but these were things that came um, out of the blue with very little warning uh, that had um, an off-the-scale uh, impact when they hit. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, after, after they'd hit, uh, we as a species would tend to sit down and think what the just happened to us and very often completely misunderstand the dynamics of what um, uh, led to that sort of set of uh, opportunities or challenges, whatever they might be. I, I, I did violence to his um, basic concept, which, as I say, straddled problems and, and, and solutions. And I said, well, you, you could see that most black swans take us in initially, at least, directions that we do not want to travel in. And they take us in those directions at exponential speeds. That doesn't mean that you start off like a rocket. It very often means that you start off very, very slowly uh, and very often exponential trends underperform uh, for a while at least the sort of the, the the linear progress trends but then there's an inflection point and at that inflection point the thing just goes berserk and it, it starts to behave in a way that you would never have uh, predicted now with covid uh, we've seen exponentials at work in a way that ordinary people have been forced uh, to understand so the Gre green swan notion was about how do we get in effect exponential progress because if we don't get it uh we're going to be stuck in a a, a very unattractive set of futures yeah. um Talib also developed of course the the subsequent concept of anti-fragility absolutely the notion of things that gain from disorder and I remember him citing evolution as an anti-fragile process for example mm -hmm. is there a, a way for us to read green swans and anti-fragility in the light of each other is anti-fragility a, a, a characteristic of green swans is green swans a, a sort of subcategory of anti-fragility or whether did their ideas just not touch each other well a couple of reflections um the first is that having done that product recall on the three p's on the triple bottom line and so on I, I then thought, well, if not that, then what? Um, and and after, again, it took me about 18 months. Uh, it seems to be a standard gestation uh, cycle with me. I got I got to the notion of, um, and I, I didn't set out to do this. It turned out to be three R's. Um, oh. So uh, we went from the three P's and expanded to three R's. The first one was responsibility. And, and, and what I began to be forced to acknowledge was that one of the reasons why the triple bottom line had not been working uh, to its full potential, or at least I didn't think so, um, was because it was typically framed as part of corporate responsibility. And as you know, what that means is being nicer and a bit better, and being transparent and engaging more of your stakeholders uh, and so on. Um, 
and, and I felt that was fine and that was a sort of necessary condition of progress and all of that had been part of opening up the business uh, uh, community to the sort of conversations that we wanted to have but but if you looked around the wider world and, and the book that book came out in 2020 um, if you looked around the wider world what you saw was a series of crises that are increasingly interlocked and if you look at the most recent global risks report that's just come out from the world economic forum i'm no great fan of the world economic forum but what the interactive diagram that they have um, uh, just published and, and and anyone can use um is that it's a nested uh, set of interlinked crises and they're in, they're in sort of our economies, they're in our societies, they're in the, the wider environment and so on. And they all are feeding into each other and creating uh, instabilities. Uh, and so my second R was resilience. Uh, and I thought what we were beginning to see was a range of um, challenges but all linked to a lack of resilience in the systems that we either had designed and created in the first place or as they have been shaped by vested interests over time so we went for efficiency rather than resilience uh, for example and the conclusion from all of that that i reached at least um was that the only way that you can build maintain healthy systems of whatever sort is to regenerate them if they're already uh, in trouble of some sort which is where the regeneration notion at least for me came i mean i i had started off working on regeneration in the 70s as a city planner um and, and even then it was economic physical social uh, environmental uh, and so on but i think the, the the urgency of the regeneration agenda is much greater now than it was uh then because an old order is is fundamentally collapsing around our ears which is a devastating observation unless you think that and i do that the old order has to come apart before the new one can properly uh, find its feet the old order is coming coming together all around us but the old one has to sort of somehow be disappeared uh, that's an unfortunate term in argentina but sorry but but um it, it has to be removed from the scene in order uh, for new ones and there will be new ones not just a single one that, that will uh, evolve in, in its place. Hmm. That relates to me a little to the fact that you talk about the idea of being able to hold two opposing ideas at one time. Um, and I find I find that very useful um, as a way of framing how we can talk about and think about uh, the climate crisis with hope, with ambition, while recognizing the severity of the situation and the fact that realistically things are going to get much worse. Um, so it's not really a question, I just wanted to put it out there that I just found that early on, the way you struck that balance between hope, op optimism, anxiety, I think, um, yeah. and, um, and, a, and drive for change um together felt like a very useful balance and and this idea of holding two opposing ideas at one time felt very um helpful well, way into thinking about that balance not remotely my idea but it's certainly one that i like and and i was just reminded a moment ago uh, you know anita roddick used to talk about the pessimism of the thought and the optimism of the action um and and, and i think that was a mm. very insightful view that it's possible to maintain a degree of hope if you're involved in positive action mm. but if you're not if you're locked up in a broom cupboard somewhere just thinking this stuff through you you end up in in in, in despair and i i don't say that lightly because um i remember quite some years ago a young colleague australian clover hogan came in and, and worked with our team for a while and she talked then as some of you will know about eco anxiety and the way in which younger people are increasingly anxious about sorts of challenges that in a sort in a way my I, I i was saying to somebody the other day that when you deal with these sorts of um systemic crises and challenges and you do it day to day and you do it with people who are not naturally switched on to all that sort of stuff you have to develop some form of clini clinical detachment mm -hmm. in order to be able to present this stuff in a way that that that, that, that at least some of these people can get their brains uh, around and since Clover started talking about that and others as well, I think that that issue of younger people 
in general, mental health, but 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 more specifically, concerned about some of these great crises that their parents and grandparents have sort of somehow got used to, and sort of accept that it's going to turn out all right in the day. I don't feel that. I I, I look at these so-called carbon bombs, you know, the the um, melting tundras and permafrosts and so on, and 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 I see, you know, the the worst crisis in the history of our species. Uh, looming and on a much uh, shorter time scale than most people were prepared to admit. And just a final point there, but many years ago in 2003, uh, one of my great privileges in my life is because I've written books, I can go and see people. Uh, and at the, in 2003, I went to the um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution on, on Cape Cod, and they do some of the very best climate science in the world, particularly when it comes to oceans. Uh, and when I, the director took us, took us around, my wife and I, for, for, for a full day, and we had presentations from different scientists. And at the end of that day, and that, and that's, that's 20 years ago, I, I literally came out with my knees knocking mm -hmm. at, 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 with having been given a fairly profound science uh, insight into where the science uh, suggested we were headed. Nothing that we have done since as a species convinces me that we will actually make this jump across the, the gaps that we now face. So when I talk about hope and optimism, I start from a point of thinking, oh my God, we're screwed. But then thinking, you're not going to get across to most people if that's your your um, uh, a message in, in Oxford uh, Street or in, in, when you're talking to them over their trolleys in the supermarket. You, you've got to, to some degree, engage people where they are. Well, I remember listening to Helen Lewis of The Atlantic saying that she used to teach a creative writing class and she always taught her students to write their villains, not as people who think they're the bad guys, <laughs> but as people who think they're the heroes of a different story. And when you talk about an old order needing to come to an end to give for a new order to take over, you know, a lot of people won't disagree with that because they don't necessarily read themselves into the old order part of the equation. I, uh, when, when I read the opening, the, op the, the opening welcome in Green Swans is, is headed upending capitalism. And uh, I, I must admit, I misread it first time. Talk about user error. I misread it as unending capitalism. Um, and some people, of course, would say that there is a conflict between capitalism and regenerative uh, approaches. Regeneration is about collective good. Capitalism is almost by definition um, about um, a partial private good. Yeah. Um, how, how do we reconcile that? And how do we make sure that the very idea of regeneration doesn't end up needing to be recalled because it's just sort of scaffolded a status quo rather than really bringing about the kinds of change that that you've been talking I about. I sort of think it will have to be recalled. And I'm fascinated to see uh, Extinction Rebellion XR having to pull back elements of their approach and say, if not that, then uh, what? Um, it's complicated. And, and one of the ways I've operated over time without thinking about it particularly has been using oxymoron slamming together unlike concepts uh, uh so green capitalists green consumers green investors was was an easy game to play 30 years ago or whatever um uh, and in putting together uh, talking about regenerative capitalism i was perfectly aware by then that these things were almost irreconcilable unless you understand capitalism as about multiple capitals about long-term uh, stewardship and investment and a bunch of other um uh, things it's interesting it's a great friend paul hawken um i asked him whether he would do uh, an endorsement uh, for green swans and he refused on the basis that um he didn't believe that uh, uh capitalism was uh, even potentially regenerative. I, I then wrote a section in his uh, later book, so I mean, we remain friends. But that, for me, was one of those moments where you 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 realize that words have consequences, and and one of the consequences, if you put things that even taking green, uh, I was reading just uh, recently something that Petra Kelly uh, wrote for us uh, back in the eighties, uh, and German green leader, and so on. Um, uh, and and just thinking, uh, what a privilege and what a responsibility it is when you engage people uh, 
like Petra in those days, who was part of a radical change agenda, and you try and make it acceptable and digestible for the business uh, community, the risk is always, again, that you dilute, again, that you help people either misunderstand accidentally or willfully, or bend uh, these sort of emergent realities to fit their own uh, particular needs. So I, I think we will need to, if not do a product recall, we're going to have to keep regeneration under a very, very, very tight uh, review. The one reason I think I am a little bit more optimistic about uh, regeneration than about sustainability, which incidentally I still think is a useful uh, concept, um, but then I would, wouldn't I? Um, regeneration is going to be a lot harder to fake, because if you're talking about whatever form of regeneration you're going to talk about, um, you can you can prove that it that the systems you're dealing with are in a process of regeneration or they're not. Whereas with sustainability, you know, that, that's how many angels on the head of a pin at times. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting point about holding business to account through that. Um, I'm curious think about the fact the notion of the old order breaking apart and yeah. uh, the new order to come in. And you've written about our increasingly crisis prone world. Of course, since the book was written, since it's come out, we've had the COVID pandemic and, and all that that's entailed. Uh, we've got the war in Ukraine. We've currently got the cost of living crisis. Um, and I'm curious as to whether two years on, three years on, you'd write the book any differently now. Is there anything you'd nuance? Well, I, as it happens, I've just within the last week or two finished a new book. And, and part of what I've been thinking about is that, I mean, what 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 has changed over those mm -hmm. few years? And when I did Green Swans, the first diagram in the book is called the U-Bend. Mm. And that was something I'd started to talk about three or four years ago. And my my I felt it in my bones that we were headed into a period where, as I've said, the old order starts to fragment and all sorts of things that we've relied on, taken for granted and so on, um, started to sort of, dis all the dissolid sort of starts to uh, become otherwise. Um, so would I would I change that? Absolutely not. Would I claim that that was a, a very clever forecast? I wouldn't. Uh, it came from that style of thinking came from two people uh, who I was exposed to, both of them dead, but, but I was exposed to at university in the late 60s. One was Nikolai Kondratiev, the other was Joseph Schumpeter. And as, as some of you will know, they, all, they both said the same thing, which was that there are these very profound long wave cycles in our economies driven by technology, pro periods of investment and disinvestment, gales of creative destruction, as, as, as Schumpeter put it. And I, I, to the absolute disgust of my economics professors, embraced some of their thinking uh, and started to think about what if there are waves that are continuing to play through our uh, economies, our world, and what if those waves are also visible in the growth of our social change movements, whether that's environmentalism, whether it's human rights, whether it's you know, anti-bribery and corruption, sustainability, circular economy, whatever we call it. Uh, and, and the answer seemed to be not only do those big waves continue to crash through and we're currently in a down wave, but under, uh, on top of that, in a way, there's another set of waves which I've been tracking since 1994, which is when we did the triple bottom line. And I, I, I did the first round of those waves with um, a colleague who's now a professor at um, uh, LSE, Nick Robbins, some of you hopefully will know him. Um, and we literally did it over a cup of tea. So this was like a cartoon. It was trying to get a sense of what do these waves look like? What do they feel like? How do they play through? Are they global? And the answer is that they're not. Uh, I was talking to a friend in Bahrain just about two weeks ago, and she was saying, we've seen no evidence of any of the five waves that we've tracked to date. Uh, but we're now seeing one coming through very, very hard. And she was saying in, in the Gulf region, she was saying every day she's getting calls from headhunters and recruiters because she's got a background in this um, area because now this thing is suddenly starting to come together. So it sounds, it's, when you talk about a U-band, it sounds, you know, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hunker down in New Zealand or Patagonia, build myself a bunker and, and, and come out when it's all over. Um, I actually think this is 
likely to be, I'm 73, I've been in this field this year for 50 years precisely, but but never precise about it. Um, I think the next 10 to 15 years, and I may say it in Green Swans, I can't remember, but I've certainly said it elsewhere, are going to be by far the most exciting, challenging, and politically dangerous of my entire working career. Because now is when it's happening, happening. And, and, and the changes as it mainstreams is becoming increasingly and intensely political and politicized. You see that with Larry Fink being slammed because of his ESG and climate positions with states like uh, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, stripping over a trillion dollars out of BlackRock. This, this is becoming political. It's going to be intense uh, and it's going to get worse as, as more and more um, vested interests wake up to the implications. But we, I, I know it, it, it's invidious to use war and battle language but but it, it is going to be a fight uh whether we like it or not uh, and and the, the the harder the conditions are uh for the people whose interests are, are challenged the harder they are going to uh, fight back hey, uh, we we want to move on to the mechanisms through which we can create the change and be better yeah, change makers but just on that note of the vision of what we're trying to create and since you've talked about the hard battle um you know often the we, we get bitten by the variables we've overlooked um and often something that's missing from um regenerative visions is the the element of of security um, yeah. I know you soft launched green swans in a remarkable summit in in Denmark with the royal family, the prime minister, thirteen hundred business leaders, and and so on, and a very around a very progressive vision for for Denmark. Um, at the same time, if you're in Ukraine, you're looking to the US for support far more than than Denmark, and we don't usually think of the US as. Um, having primarily been such a great champion on sustainability over the long period. Have you been taking an interest in the intersectionality between sustainability and security? And do you have any thoughts on the right way for us to think about that? I don't think there's probably any right way to think about anything. So uh, forgive me if I pontif pontificate for a moment. But no, in terms of defence and the military and so on, I'm, I'm slightly out of the usual mainstream of green and environment and sustainability in the sense that my father was a Battle of Britain pilot. I grew up in an Air Force family traveling. We didn't live on uh, bases, but, but no, that was the reality that I saw. And because of that, I was fascinated by aviation and aerospace and aircraft design and so on. Um, and, and so I've long taken an interest in, in, in what is the interface between defense and security and sustainability and so on. And I've written chapters for Jürgen Randers' book, 2052, something 10 years plus ago. Um, a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, in the middle of the lockdown, I did a session for the Ministry of Defence here. And it was, I was surrounded virtually by admirals and generals and this, that and the other. And what they were talking about um, was um, the way in which climate uh, change seems to be accelerating. Uh, it is on an exponential scale. We already see destabilization of European societies by uh, migration. Uh, and the, the the sense was and is that what we're seeing with current levels of migration is a tiny fraction of what's going to come when, for example, climate chaos gets its claws into Africa. Um, and, and so it, it's interesting that some of the most thoughtful people on these sorts of issues are now in the security world i mean it's a different form of security clearly but 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 they're starting to, and you saw it with um the admirals in the us and the pentagon you saw it recently with 18 security agencies from around the uh, world getting together to warn that climate water biodiversity all of these things are interlinked they, they have the capacity to profoundly destabilize our civilization and, and create uh, you know conflicts wall to wall so y y yes it's something that i think about but i tend and then one of the people i met through that uh, ministry of defense session tammy evans who was a colonel in the uh, british army she and i then wrote a piece on the interlinkages between all of this for the carnegie um uh, institute so the simple answer is I, I i i am interested in it but i don't find many other people in the sustainability world or similar are that 
wildly concerned about all of that. So I, I don't keep mum about it, but it's it, it it's it's not wildly popular at times. Um, I'm interested to think more about what what we do with um, all the, the insight guidance from green swans. And as I was reading it, I was trying to put myself in the shoes of different people that I work with, um, whether it's a CEO, a CSO, a marketer. Uh, and I was thinking, who who is this book for? Obviously, it's relevant for a wide audience. But I was curious as to when you were writing it, did you have in mind a desired focal reader? And what did you want them to do with what they gained from the book? Well, it's interesting. When I first came across Lynn, Lynn Franks, uh, with the Green Consumer Guide back in the late 80s, uh, we had, I, I wrote that book with a very young friend and colleague, Julia Hales. And, and if I'd written that book at that stage, I would have written something on the issues. And Julia kept banging me around the head saying, what would Mrs. Bloggs think? You know, how does she go about her shopping behavior and in, in the high street or where it happens to be? She goes into a supermarket. How does she th see all these different categories of product and brands within that and so on? Um, so the the, 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 the the nice answer would be to say, I learned from Julia and every book I do, I think very, very long and hard about uh, who the audience is going to be. It's not entirely true. I sometimes say when I when I when I um, uh, don't understand a new emerging field, and I love to be in that position of not understanding something that is emergent, and then having to go out and be curious and explore. I write a book, uh, and and so in some senses, the book is as much for me as it is for um, uh, anyone else. And I, I I had been going to see people like Kevin Kelly. Uh, who was uh, one of the founding editors of Wired uh, magazine. I went to, went to see him uh, in California. And, and you know, he talks about um, exponential technology and so on in ways that I still struggle to understand. I've worked with people like the X Prize. In fact, one of our board members is was previously the chief scientist at the X Prize Foundation. And so I was immersed in all of that. But I was trying to think about them how does that apply into the world that I'm operating in? How does that apply to some of the businesses that we work uh, with? And we're not trying to seduce and sell to every business in the world. We're trying to engage a handful of businesses who properly and, and um, honestly want to transform what they do. Th that's the business model and, and the, almost the impact model that we um, uh, have adopted and so in, in a way the book was for them and, and has been used in that way more than it was for every business school in the world although it would have been nice and it would be nice if you know, every business school uh, picked up uh, on, on on that sort of thinking whether it comes through that book or others. John you um you, you candidly mentioned just before we went live that you have quite a few a mistake antibodies uh, with regards to uh, marketers and, and the marketing profession. Yeah. Um, you can think of marketing as a department in a business alongside other departments. You can also think of it as a narrative-based discipline alongside other narrative-based disciplines, whether it's therapy, psychiatry, fiction, art, politics. Um, and obviously you think very highly of stories. I mean, there's a, a chapter in Green Swans called Miracles on Demand. Yeah. Uh, where you write about the value of a, a, a new story and first of all, making an old story, uh, revealing that an old story it tends to collapse and, and replacing it with a new story of hope. Um, for a community of, of marketers and change makers who believe in the power of narrative, are there ways that we can take a greater level of responsibility for ensuring that there are a few more miracles on demand and <laughs> what what would be your message to us so that antibodies might not be needed in future i at some level i don't know who i'm talking to here because the, any profession marketing profession or any other is a very disparate community i'm making a wild assumption that there's some degree of natural selection going on here where the people who come onto a uh, a call like this are broadly interested in the sorts of things that I'm interested in and, and therefore would approach the uh, the game, the profession, um, the practice of marketing in, in a way that I would be comfortable with 
But very often, <laughs> thanks for the thumbs up, um, <laughs> but, but very often where I work with marketing uh, people, that hasn't been their game. It hasn't been their role. It hasn't been their brief. They, they feel quite trammeled, quite constrained um, by the brief that they're uh, following. And, and very often, I would say, that in the very, and I've worked now for over, 50, over 40 years with business, uh, and in the earliest days, and certainly into the well into the 1990s, there were three or four roles that were always a headache. Chief financial officer, always a headache. Uh, chief lawyer, or legal officer, or whatever, um, general counsel, whatever, always a headache, particularly in the United States. And the brand uh, people, absolute screaming headache in the sense that they just did not want anyone to get in the way of their wonderful connection with uh, consumers. Anything that played to something they couldn't deliver uh, challenged sort of their definitions of quality, raised issues that they didn't know how to address. They loathed, and, and in a very quiet way, in a very civilized, genteel way, they fought back viciously. Now, I, I, I saw that in companies like Procter and Gamble, and yet it changed fairly quickly. Uh, and that was partly generational, younger people coming up into the marketing profession. But it was also a sense that something was going on in the wider world that they didn't properly understand. And therefore, they felt a need to engage with that uh, wider um, uh, world. So I I think if, if marketing is about um, storytelling in the sense that it's honest it's legitimate it's fact-based it's science-based it's in the proper interest including the long interest long-term interests of investors in the company employees and others in within the company and people in the supply chain but critically of the people who are buying the product or service then that form of marketing is something i can get behind but too often what i saw in the early days was not that form of marketing Continuing on a uh, related thread to narratives, I'm interested in the role of the media in yeah. creating the conditions for uh, green swans to emerge and thrive. What, what role do you see the media having in enabling a green swan environment? And where there are challenges that might need possibly reform, if there are any, in order to make that happen? Well, the media is is a very broad uh, term, and it gives us the comfort of thinking that there is this huge, great sort of thing out there which is pretty consistent and mm -hmm. homogenous. And of course, we all know it isn't. Um, and 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 you've got um, some billionaires directing very large uh, media companies who inter whose interests are not directly ours. Um, but at the other end, you've got uh, people like the Guardian, who I mean, I, I I wrote for the Guardian for about thirty years, and and alongside all sorts of different journalists, all of them good-hearted uh, people. I, one of the early ones was Harford Thomas. He described what he did as process reporting. He was always trying to look for the story behind the story, rather than just taking a press release or whatever. Um, I think we are in a very critical um, period in the evolution of the media scape in that sense or media verse or whatever because people like mark uh, zuckerberg are now engaged they have the potential whether they intend to or not to corrupt uh, our understanding of, of 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 what we get through media um and i think social media i always remember aldous huxley talking about uh, soma the sort of opium dope like uh whatever that that just sedates um uh, populations. And I've been looking just recently at the coverage of Harry and Meghan, for example, and it's saturation, as we all know. And at exactly the time, and various people have been saying this, at exactly the time when they should be paying attention to the big issues that, are, God save us, are being uh, discussed in uh, Davos and places like that, but also to climate and these sorts of things. But that's not what the media does. That's not what sells newspapers. Um, and 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 whether it's uh, broadsheet publishing or whether it's tabloids or whether it's social media, um, a lot of the good messaging gets swamped out. So I, 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 every so often, my prior company, previous company, sustainability, we did a couple of quite deep studies on on, on the media and and their impact on the way that we uh, behave, the way that we think, 
the priorities we have. And it's pretty fundamental. And I, I, I don't think we've yet cracked that challenge of how do we pick the media up by the scruff of the neck and give them a really good shaking. Uh, they need it. Uh, and quite a number of people inside that world understand that they need it, but they can't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. I am um, very much share uh, those concerns. It is very difficult to find a, a media out there through which you can really understand in a representative way the, the yeah. nature of the world's problems. I mean, there are about maybe 12 crises at the moment around the world that have a similar severity rating to Ukraine. Um, and yet the news is, you know, which politician was caught out saying the wrong thing and and so on. So that that strikes me as one of the biggest obstacles to progress that we have. Um, but in terms of making progress, um, of course, you're by my standards, extraordinarily successful in business with four businesses that you founded that are all still up and running. But even by orders of magnitude greater uh, in terms of your success as a change maker. Um, when engaging with clients, so you're sort of on the outside, but welcomed in, you know, have the, what have been the sort of the, what's the latest evolution in how you go about engaging with a, a client so that you can actually get them to um, not just better achieve their goals, but maybe to have a better vision of what they're working towards in the first place? Well, let, let me just say something about media that that I should have said at the time. And, you know, progress is happening. And I look at, for example, my favorite newspaper now, it didn't used to be, but the Financial Times, and how the Financial Times routinely, re routinely regularly and in considerable depth uh, covers the sorts of issues that we're all concerned about, if I can make that sort of uh, assumption. And and um, even, for example, I, I helped set up something called Business Declares after the Extinction Rebellion. Uh, protests uh, to try and bring the business world into all of this and the financial times has now joined uh business declares as, as as a member that was after i stepped down from the board not not during my time there but you know I, progress is being made but it's it, it it's often uh too slow um remind me what the question was how can i be so universally successful and all the rest of it um we're not uh, uh, we try and be open. I've mean, always said to clients, you know, if things go wrong on our watch while we're dealing with you, uh, we'll talk about that in public. Yes, we'll sign a non-disclosure agreement, but you know, if things go horribly wrong, don't expect us to stay mum or silent and so on. So we've done that, and one of the reasons we've done that is because um, we feel that these exercises that we're involved in are learning processes, not just for ourselves and our client, but they potentially are. Um, for the wider world. And I remember one person in Shell in the mid-1990s say, saying to me, a very senior person in Shell, saying, I do not want you turning my company into a laboratory. And I said, but that's what we do. I mean, if, we, if we're going to be here, that's exactly what we're going to be uh, doing because we don't have all the answers. We don't know how this is going to play out. We don't know what's going to work in your uh, culture or, 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 or whatnot. Let me creep up on an answer to your question, uh, Paul. And 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 I've said this before, but I, I I'll reiterate it because I think it's at least it feels important to me. And 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 some of you will remember Hurricane Katrina uh, in two thousand five. It took a great bite out of uh, New Orleans and, and and its region. And one company, Walmart, lost over a hundred stores overnight. And they were one of the companies that reacted from all of that. Lee Scott was then their CEO by deciding that enough was enough and they were going to try and embrace climate change as an issue. Now, they, they weren't good on community. They weren't good on a lot of supply chain issues and all the rest of it or, or employee uh, terms and conditions. But, but, but they decided to go after that one. And in very short order, within four months, I found myself in the boardrooms of two uh, or with the boards of, of, of two major suppliers to Walmart. The first one was DuPont, and I met their board in London, so this wasn't uh, where they'd normally be in Wilmington. But the second was 3M. And both of those companies had a sort of really spectacular track record in embracing health, safety, environment, these sorts of issues. And I went to um, Minnesota to talk to the, uh, the, the 3M people. And at the end of the board meeting, a woman came up to me, and she was, she was a board member, but she, she was equivalent to a non-executive director. And she said, why do you use in your, your interactions at this level, why do you use humor? 
And it's the first time I'd really been forced to think about it. And I don't tell jokes. I can't remem remember them to save my life. I mean, it's all situational. It's all in the moment. It's all playing off something that somebody is saying. And it's a deadly dangerous game if you get it wrong. And so I said, no, I don't know, but I, it's something that I've, I've learned to do over time. And she said she was she was originally trained as a psychologist and she she had two reflections which always stuck with me. And the first was the very fact that you're able to be playful with your own agenda uh, is is reassuring to these people because they they suddenly realize they're not dealing with a missionary. And so, you know, some of those defenses can go down. But then she said, you're talking to these people in a way that they're not used to being talked to. Mm. This doesn't happen in the boardroom. So what's going on in their brain? Well, she said, it's the reptilian part of the brain switching on. And it's thinking, if he can do this, how big is his army outside? Uh, and I never thought about it that way. And so I, I have no grand theory about how you engage people beyond the fact it's human to human You've got to have a conversation. So if they're interested in golf, God save us, I'll talk to them about golf. Or if, it, you know, if they've got 71 grandchildren, I'll, I'll sort of um, talk about grandchildren or whatever it is. But you, you've somehow got to ex establish that sort of basic human um, interface, interaction, whatever, develop a conversation and then see where it leads. And I was on a call just, just to, to conclude this one, but with a Spanish company earlier on, today and they'd asked us basically to pitch on the strength of another spanish company that we've been working with and after five minutes i said this is not a project for us this is we, we can't do this firstly we don't we're not fluent in spanish that's going to be necessary we tend to shy away from the public sector and government wherever we can do it we'll only we don't only but wherever we can we'll work with the private sector um this is not going to go anywhere very good and so we know it was all friendly but we, we ended the call there and so part of my answer to your question would be you have to know what you're in, in business to get done you then have to be very critical about who you then work with uh and and you can never quite know uh i mean one of the big i, I said to finish but let me just finish with something else uh one of the biggest disasters that uh, Valance had um, after we set it up in 2008, we set up an office in Singapore and the Economic Development Board there, part of the government, was a very big sponsor uh, of our work and, and of that office. Three years in, uh, it went wobbly. There was a outbreak of uh, avian flu in, in, in one of the markets we were serving. A bunch of things went wrong. Um, cut a long story short, when the when the conversations with EDB started, uh, I came back from a breakfast in London with some of the people from EDB, and I said, we can work with these people. And a younger colleague said, how can you possibly know on the basis of a, you know, a 45, 60 minute uh, conversation? And I said, because there was playfulness there. And if that's, that's not there, you, there's no way that you're going to help them uh, take big risks and, 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 and um, do unexpected things three years on when everything went wobbly uh they said edb said to us uh, you know the small uh, print in the contract it means we can claw back all the money that we've given you that would have meant death really uh, uh, for us it took about three months for them to decide it had to go up to their board they came back and said two things one no claw back and secondly how do we help keep you in singapore and that for me was for, for for people in the government world to to take that sort of level risk on the back of disaster was i thought really encouraging and maybe i had misread them i don't think so but 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 from that initial breakfast there was something about the human uh nature of the the the, the back and forth which just struck me as i think we can work with these people and i think that's where it starts it doesn't it doesn't remotely end there um how can we get better just to end on a practical note before we <laughs> forward, um, <laughs> before we get towards um opening the floor up to questions yeah. how can we get better at identifying the signals of opportunity for green swans to emerge and are there any examples of green swans that have come to light perhaps particularly since you've written the book that we can draw inspiration from 
Well, I think anything that's digital has the potential to be a green swan, but it has, has a, a, a potential to take us in other ways. So, for example, one of the areas that I've, I've got much more actively involved in uh, since green swans came out is artificial intelligence. Uh, and as I said earlier on, I, I like to be where I don't know what I'm meant to be doing, and I'm sort of on some uh, learning curve. And I went to see DeepMind a, a few years back. Uh, some of you will know they were subsequently acquired by Google. But I, I talked to some young people there who were designing AI systems of one sort or another. And I have to say it was like dealing with a, an alien species. I love them to pieces. I mean, they were very sort of human and engaging. But they spoke five times as fast as I did. And their brains were channeling a totally different uh, reality. Uh, so on the one hand, I can find that exciting. Uh, I know AI is going to drive green swans. Uh, you know, some of them will be green, others will be other colors. Um, uh, but if we leave the development of AI to some of the people who are in the coding roles at the moment, who tend to be very often uh, younger white males who've dropped out of college with no background on uh, the arts and, 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 and the rest of it, uh, God help us. Uh, in a way, so I, you know, I, I can, I can. Thanks, Elaine, very much. I, I can talk about um, things that I think have incredible potential, and and I could say that around uh, AI clearly and expert systems. I can say it around autonomous vehicles. I mean, if we get that right, the impact on our cities will be profoundly uh, positive. But th there's a big if there. Synthetic biology. Um, uh, you know, this, this starting to design organisms that have never been known in the past. I worked for 15 years with the biotechnology and genetic engineering uh, industry. When I first went in, uh, there were a lot of people talking about the environmental benefits that will come from the, this. By the end of the 15 years, much of that had been forgotten in the race for, uh, you know, bottom line uh, performance and, and, uh, and so on. So I think anything that's digital uh, has the potential to go in that direction. Anything that has to do with the um, production of memes, uh, by which I mean, you know, Richard Dawkins' notion of the, uh, the, the sort of the, the the mind viruses in a positive sense, uh, really important as well. Because as we saw with COVID nineteen, things like viruses do flash through our populations for better or worse very very fast, and that leads me to not just media uh, and how do we reform that world, but to education. And when I talk about education, I'm not just talking about schools and colleges and universities and business schools. I'm talking about education at every age of society. And I think one of our biggest problems going forward is there are going to still be a lot of people of my age who are forced to stay in employment, whose values and whose understanding of the wider world, as it's now shaping up, may be actually quite poor. Mm. That's not a... That's not a, 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 a uh, a public health warning, but I mean, it, it tends to be the case that as people age, they become more conservative, more defensive, trying to hang on to what uh, they know. And probably that's the last thing we need now. We, we, we need elements of the best of conservatism, but we actually need to uh, be profoundly uh, radical and disruptive uh, at the same time. So I, I, I could go on with the list, but I mean, there's no shortage of things out there um, that I think could be and I think the regeneration thing is really important because if once, as we've seen time and again, and one of the things I've done since Green Swans came, came out is talk to some of the leading practitioners of regeneration around the world, from Ivan Shuinar at Patagonia to the guy who basically is saving the Iraqi marshes after Saddam Hussein wrecked them, Azam Alwash is his name. And what, what Azam will say, Dr. Azam will say, is... Um, if you put the water back in a, an ecosystem like that, the ecosystem knows what to do. Just, just put the water in and get out of the way. Uh, and, and so in many of these regenerative projects, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of taking the pressure off. It may be hunting, it may be fishing pressure, it may be you know, uh, logging pressure or whatever. And it doesn't always happen, and it doesn't always happen as it should. But, but when the pressure comes off, the regeneration does happen. We see that rewilding re it all sorts of different projects. So in, in a way, that's what keeps me hopeful. But whether that's delusional or not remains to be seen. Such a fascinating range of things we've covered. But um, I'm keen to 
to turn to the group for any yes. any questions from the the group to you um people can can raise their digital hands and then Louise and I will come to you I also have some further questions up, up my sleeve if people don't take the opportunity um I did see that that Roy had um put a question in the chat so um if Roy's able to unmute then I'll go to Roy and otherwise um uh, we could then go to to Kristin and and Liz who've been very quick with their digital hands thanks Paul it's Roy can you hear me I can. It's good to see everyone. And thanks, John, for uh, for taking us through Green Swans and other things in the past hour. It's been a, a joy. Um, I'm a chemist and how on earth I sit with marketing kind, I'm not entirely sure. But um, I also w used to work at Procter & Gamble. Yeah. Um, now I'm giving a sustainability talk next week at a significant chemistry conference. And um, I've been preparing it. And there is some fantastic work going on in many major corporates that I'm involved with, in fact. Yeah. However, when I looked at um, consumption, and I'll bring marketing into this at this point, um, consumption between 2022 and 2030 of major product areas, and I include apparel, aviation, consumer goods, and other things, it explodes between 2022 and 2030. And essentially, what I'll be talking to them about is trying to catch up in formulation terms and in chemistry terms with um, a tsunami, frankly, yeah. of um, increasing use of fossil fuel based materials, which impact hugely in the environment. And I'm not quite sure how to get out of that consumption how to how to deal with that consumption message in a positive manner because it's fairly obvious that it's going to happen john over to you <laughs> <laughs> well, well well firstly roy i mean i gave up chemistry when i was 14 i was f forced to do so by my school and because i refused to cut out frogs and if you didn't do that you'd have to get rid of all uh science but nonetheless i chemistry i think is a fundamental uh discipline and i wish i understood it properly i remember uh, suddenly seeing the formula for sugar uh production from you know all, all, all of sunlight and the rest of it and thinking my god this stuff is magical let me let me say two things one is would love to continue the conversation because you, you you're involved in things that i'm not and, and and this holds true for anyone else in this call i mean i'm always interested to hear what other people are doing and and, and to learn uh from that um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, some of you have seen just in the last couple of days, has published a report saying that the uh, global economy has become less circular uh, in recent years. Um, so exactly underscoring uh, what you're saying, Roy, I, 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 I think we shouldn't breathe our own exhaust fumes, as the American like, look, uh, like to put it, or, or, or sort of believe our own propaganda. The very fact that we're talking about sustainability or regeneration or circularity or whatever, mm -hmm doesn't mean that it's necessarily happening in the wider world and we have to be immensely uh, self-critical but I think chemistry and biochemistry and biomimicry and some of these disciplines are fundamentally important in what comes next and anyone who is anti-science or anti-technology I think um, will struggle to find a place in, in, in building the economic transformation that we uh, now, now need to sort of drive uh, forward. So thanks for the question. And uh, genuinely, I'd be open to an ongoing uh, conversation. I just see Martin Utley put in something about reading my books at Presidio uh, Graduate School. Well, thank you for that observation. But uh, and I like the cap. But um, uh, I had something from uh, the, the, the youngest daughter of a neighbor about a week ago. She's at Manchester University. And she, she got in touch with me on LinkedIn. And she said, one of your books is is um, a set reading for us in, in our course. And I said, well, that's interesting, but which is it? And she said, The Green Capitalists, and that was published in 1987. So I sort of wish some of these academic institutions would slightly get onto exponential uh, curves of their own. But back to you, Paul and Louise. Um, thank you very much, John. So I think in order of hands going up, we've got um, Kristen, we've got Liz, and then we've also got Lynn. 
Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm hoping we can get through at least questions from um, these three members before we get towards wrapping up, because we try to be disciplined about finishing on time. Um, Kristen, should we go to you first? Yes, thanks, Louise, and good to see you. Um, John, it's a privilege to ask you a question because uh, you were my reading my first week at the Business Sustainability Management class at, at Cambridge, <laughs> and so it's a, it's a, a pleasure. Um, and I hope at some point we get to continue a conversation, but you mentioned um, at some point in the discussion today, you talked about radical change yeah. and you talked about needing to make it digestible for the business community, but yet you only work or you try to mostly work with the business community and uh, learning that maybe the business community is the most prepared to handle and deliver radical change as more quickly than governments, for example, or 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 uh, citizens. So I'm curious, just if that was a slip of the tongue, or could you expound just a few minutes on may, how to bring radical change into the business community? No, it wasn't a slip of the tongue. Thank okay. You for the Look forward to a continuing conversation. Um, I, I am not logical in what I do, and I'm an opportunist. I've often joked that uh, I always envy James Bond, because every time he gets into any uh, villain's um, uh, control room, he knows which button to press. And I've never known at any point in my life which buttons to press uh, and which not. So I have to just stab at everything in sight. So if you're expecting coherence or logic, um, uh, good luck. Um, uh, the task has become easier over time because there is a different generation or there are different generations of younger people coming up. So when I compare what it was like when I first uh, approached companies like Procter & Gamble, but others way before that, it was really it was it was an intergenerational divide. And, and, and people would often say, well, you're green, but that's a watermelon. You're actually red inside and you're anti-capitalist. Uh, and, 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 you know, we, we don't hear quite so much of that um, uh, now. And in fact, some of the most uh, active and effective activists around the world are, in fact, business leaders. So, you know, that, that's been a, a fundamental shift. But I, I think maybe I'm um, being weak kneed by, by only wanting to work with people who want to work with us and, and are prepared to commit to fairly transformative uh, change. But that's, that's where we think true leadership is going to come from. Whether or not other people come up that curve in their wake, you know, remains to be uh, seen. But but um, it's more about that. getting them to commit to do it. Yes. Yeah. Even before they know they, what it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, that's the inverse of marketing. Very often yeah. people come to us because they've heard that we have that difficult reputation uh, and, and, and they want to explore what that might mean in, 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 in their case. Okay. Whereas I, I fight marketing as it's conventionally done in our organization because that puts you where you're then having a negotiation around or discussion around value and i want it, it also to be around values is the way i try and uh, explain it thank you thank you Kristen. Uh, liz over to you hello john oh sorry um the question that I wanted to raise was one around how do we deal with corporate death? Because if we are to transition, there's going to be a lot of things that are redundant. Yes. And a lot of people are heavily invested in things that need to be redundant. Yeah. And both of us have done this for a very long time. And it's that kind of emotional uh, barrier that you have to get through when you're working with any community that that you're prepared to take them into spaces they're uncomfortable with yeah. and actually saying what you do is not to be done is the hardest conversation and I just wonder how we go through that um, to give people a sense that they can reinvent themselves well, it, I mean, again, thanks for the question. And the answer is, at least in my mind, um, people always find it difficult to discuss death. Uh, it's it's not a terribly pleasant um, uh, theme most people uh, uh, find. Um, but I do it uh, very often in the very early uh, stages of a conversation where, for example, I'm doing a presentation to the board 
I will talk about Kondratiev. I will talk about Schumpeter. I will talk about these gales of creative destruction. And I will talk about the way in which at certain points in our um, economic evolution, these scales of destruction mean that hundreds and thousands of, of, of companies disappear. And I, I, I've been saying for decades now, when this really starts to gain traction, this agenda of ours, some of the best known brands in the world will disappear before our eyes. I mean, you look at some of the companies that are most actively lobbying against anything sensible and sustainable mobility at the moment. Toyota is being uh, pilloried at the moment, and I think deservedly so. And one of the things that we are now working on, and, and with some of the better uh, companies, big and small, is a project looking at the future of corporate advocacy. When I started working with companies like Shell, we wanted to keep companies like that as far out of politics as we possibly could get them, because we didn't trust their instincts. But now we need them to be on our side and pushing uh, for change. And so... Um, I don't talk much about death there, but it may well be that in, in some of these people's minds, there will be this uh, growing unease that unless they can solve some of these bigger issues on behalf of the market and on behalf of the society as a whole, their company is not going to have. I mean, you hear them people saying, and some of it's scripted and some of it's parroted, but you know, there's, there's no good business on a, on a, on a planet that's dead. Uh, so I, I think we're getting there. Um, but it's always a, a, a difficult conversation. And even as you say stuff around uh, the extinction of certain sectors of industry, asbestos or you know, certain applications of lead or whatever it happens to be, there's something about the human brain that doesn't hear that. Well, that's them. And even if they're in the same sector, that's them still. That's not going to happen to us. Um, so if you've got some uh, good prescriptions on how we engage uh, corporates around their prospects around death I'd, I'd love to hear them that's the first that's the first for me to getting into some of that but I think Louise had mentioned that she'd spotted Lynn has a question and if that's still the case we'll, we'll go to to Lynn um I, the, I, I know there are still one or two more but we'll see if there's time thank you Paul thank hi you. John lovely to see you again after all these years and thank <laughs> you Thanks, the same. Um, I've got two questions I'd like to ask one is, and you've touched on them, but I'd like to go a little bit further into it. Yeah. Firstly, the word sustainability, which of course you quite rightly have every claim to own, um, is a quite a um, an interesting point right now in the world. You've, you did touch on it because it's like, how do we define the sustain, what sustainability, sustainability means and how serious can we take it? And it's certainly a marketing way of word. My brand <clears throat> to teach women to start small businesses from the kitchen table is seed and has been for 20 odd years and that's an acronym for sustainable enterprise and empowerment dynamics and i still use the word sustainability with pride but jem bendel who is a friend of mine who i'm sure you know yes. he's declaring that sustainability is dead it doesn't mean anything anymore and he was a professor of sustainability at durham of course um and so that's the first question is how much how how much further do you think we can go with sustainability as a word because i love it and i want to keep yeah. using it and the second thing is, as you as you said, I worked with you, I'm delighted to say, to promote your book, Green Consumer. Um, um, and um, how far do you think we've gone from those days, which was, I can't, I mean, it must be nearly 50 years ago, talking about the green consumer, which nearly, lot, nearly, but didn't lose me a number of my corporate clients who said, yeah. we're going to get the, us, thing, you know, fingered by the media. And I said, well, you've got to change your ways and learn from this. And um, uh you know, and they did actually. But I mean, how far do you think we've come a lot? Have we come a long way? I mean, Anita, our old friend Anita Roddick, of course, would be talking about green consumers as well. Have yeah. we gone far? Are they really aware? Is that part of the marketing mix that people want green products now, or do they want the cheaper still? I mean, especially in the current fight, economic economic situation. Yeah, wonderful questions, Lynn. And and let me start with the second. Uh, first, so I think green consumerism was in effect like. Um, the exercise was a bit like using shock troops. You, you, you actually went for, we went for business uh, collectively uh, from an angle that business did not expect. So it was business like, I mean, I remember ICI, for example, almost instructing me to go away. I, I did a, 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 an exhibition at the design center called The Green Designer. And at the end of it, I, I put a, in the catalog, uh, and once you've done all this wonderful design and engineering, will it appeal to the green consumer? 
And somebody who was the group environment advisor then of ICI came up to me afterwards and said, the trouble with you environmentalists is you tell us to do this stuff. And when we've done it, no one wants to buy it. Mm-hmm. And, and several of their products were in the exhibition. And the, the seed of the Green Consumer Guide came from that. And, and I, ironically, uh, three different parts of ICI then sued us when the book came out. None of them succeeded. We won all the cases, even though we were then working with their chairman. And that just that 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 illustrates in a way for me at least the 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 degree of disruption and upending that was then happening so i think the green consumer was a a shock tactic it lasted for about four or five years um there were there have been all sorts of companies that have continued to uh, channel that sort of interest those sort of priorities but as we all know it 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 remains a a somewhat smaller uh, element of the uh, economy and particularly if you look at it globally but it's always there potentially to be harnessed if you get the timing right if you get the messaging right uh, and so on and people increasingly now do want to do the right thing you see the buzz around electric cars I mean the question then is whether they work well and all the rest of it but uh, um, but I, I think the green consumer is not dead but I think but Maybe it's time money. we got together and revived it. <laughs> then let, let, let's at least have a, 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 a coffee and, and continue that conversation. Yeah, so your, cool. your, your, your second uh, uh, plea for reassurance around sustainability. Um, let, me, let me just say a couple of things about that. I, I, I think sustainability as a concept will still be with us in 100 years. I think it's one of these things like humanity, liberty, whatever, as a principle, as uh, people have described as a compass point. I think it will, it, it's now entrenched in the language, it will not go away. But any uh, concept like this has its ups uh, and downs. And, and, and by the time you professionalize something, I, I know I, I respect Jem immensely, but by the time you get people who have critical faculties and then have jobs to, it's like the early years of a religion. You, you, you know, have lots of priests going out and pontificating but some of them will be asking the difficult questions. Uh, and that's what people like Jem are now doing. And if you see the herd, the human species, embracing a new religion or sustainability and, and um, not properly comprehending what the agenda actually implies for their thinking and behavior and all the rest of it, then it th- then you have to react. And I think what people like Jem and others are doing in, 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 in challenging uh, sustainability is, is 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 great, but I think if we succeed in switching off business at the, exactly the point when they have you know scores of of chief sustainability officers, that's not necessarily uh, uh, the best way forward because what we may find is that, that they'll simply drop those roles and then have no proper engagement with this agenda. Uh, at all. I, I don't expect that outcome, but I, I think we have to have a longer term perspective. Language is important. We've got to make sure it's properly used if, if, if it is uh, important. Uh, but I, I think sustainability will be uh, around for a very long time and certainly see you out, Lynn. Yes, that's good. To hear. Yeah, well, I'm even <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Lynn, um, for wrapping up with excellent questions. So our standard intro line into the last part of the conversation and to wrapping up is to say that we promised to end our gatherings on time. So we must wrap up. (laughs) I failed there. Um, And I think a learning is that... um, we could we could do with a bit more time in in this kind of format where we're all together uh, talking. It's been a very rich conversation, and we or a huge... bit more discipline, Louis. <laughs> <I'll give you> <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm not the best at timekeeping personally, um, but it's been a hugely uh, rich discussion. It's been fascinating to to talk with you, John, and there's a lot more that we would uh, collectively love to explore with you, but we we have to stop at some point. Um, so I must I must let everyone go. I just want to do a quick quick pitch for the next uh, gathering. Um, So from the green consumer into citizens, thinking of people as citizens rather than consumers. Uh, So on March 7th, we'll be talking with John Alexander, the author of Citizens, why the key to fixing everything is all of us. So uh, we'd love to see you there. And if you'd like to become a member of Marketing Kind, if you're not yet, then just uh, shimmy over to marketingkind.org to find out more, to introduce yourself and to have a conversation with us. Um, And feedback on this format as well, most welcome. First time we've done uh, a gathering in this way rather than as a webinar. Um, Feels like it's been uh, incredibly uh, rich and participatory, but we'd love to hear what you thought. 
Um, so again, John, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have just scratched the surface of everything that we would love to explore with you, but it's been incredibly insightful, provocative, interesting. I could keep going on, but then we'll never finish. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Louise. Thanks, Paul. And I'm going to find my shimmy outfit uh, immediately. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.